Kind of been in the mood to do something British themed since I went to an Iron Maiden concert about a couple weeks ago. But at least I wasn't this guy. Sign me blessed! Sign me blessed! And actually, it takes me a lot to fangirl out. Although I will admit I probably fangirled out a little bit when I met Tim from the Military Arms Channel about two months ago. And whether or not I asked him to sign me breasts, well, that's between me, him, about eight other people who were there, and the judge who ordered that I stay at least a thousand feet away from anyone who has over a hundred thousand YouTube subscribers. In the years prior to World War II, most of the belligerents including Germany, Italy, Japan, France, the United States, and even the Soviet Union had adopted a semi-automatic sidearm, while Great Britain would wait until eight years after the war to adopt a semi-auto. After the First World War, Britain liked the stopping power of the 455 Webley fired from the Webley Mark VI but they wanted a smaller round for easier marksmanship training as they believed the Mark VI was too large for military use. They figured that a 38 caliber with 200 grain bullet was as effective as the 455 at stopping an enemy. Webley obliged and more or less scaled down the Mark VI to make the Mark IV, which was chambered in 38-200, or 38 Smith & Wesson as known in the United States. The heavy nose bullet relied on keyholing to create a larger wound. Since Webley made the most trusted sidearms in World War I and was loved by police and civilian markets, they should have had this in the bag. But the British government decided to have the Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield Lock produce a pistol. This resulted in the Enfield No. 2 MK1, which is nearly identical to the Webley Mark, VI, or Mark IV. Webley contested the decision, but Enfield countered that Captain Boy designed this pistol with the help of Webley. In a case of the government siding with their own against a private company, the claim was denied, although Webley and Scott did receive a small sum from the Inventors Commission for their work. After the start of the war, though, Enfield could not keep up, so Webley Mark IVs were used, and even they couldn't keep up, as many Smith & Wesson victories were brought over from the United States. In 1938, there was an update to the No. 2 Mark I, which became the No. 2 Mark I Star which removed the spur from the hammer, making, it, making the revolver a double action only. This lightened the trigger and made it accurate for quickly firing off shots at close range. The double action pull made it not so good for longer deliberately aimed shots. Because of the lack of spur, many soldiers were happy when they can get their hands on the Webley or a Victory. Many armorers would even convert the infields back to the Mark I, minus the star, variant. These revolvers were finally replaced by the Browning High Power in 1953, but were not completely phased out of service until 1969. A little bit about my particular revolvers. My Enfield No. 2 Mark I Star is the only British World War II vet. It was made in 1942 according to the markings on top of the barrel. My Mark IV was actually produced in 1968 and sold to the Israeli Police Force. I noticed the Star of David in front of the cylinder. My Smith & Wesson Victory, which I will give it its own video in the future, is actually an American vet. It has the V and a serial number that puts it made, being made in 1943. The flaming bomb and the fact that it's actually chambered in 38 Special tell me that it was used by American armed forces, and these were the official sidearms of Marine and Navy air crews. I shot my infield in Webley, and they definitely have less recoil than the 455 Webley. Although, as I stated in my Mark VI videos, these really didn't have much recoil to begin with. Firing double action, I did prefer the infield, but I do not like not having a single action option. The infield performed flawlessly. The Mark IV did have a couple light primer strikes, but other eyes performed well. The top brake and the ejector made for relatively quick reloading. Overall, these are great revolvers, but they're just revolvers.
I would take a 1911, a P38, or a TT33 any day over this antiquated, even by 1940 standards, technology. And I know that the likes of Yankee Marshall aren't going to see this video, so I'm not too worried. If you like what you see, please check out my Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon links, and please comment and subscribe. I'll also include a link below for uh, seeing Arsenal shirts. Uh, these are getting down to the last 10 days to get these, so if you want to help out something pretty important, uh, please buy some of these shirts from them. Uh, thank you for watching, and as always, have a great day. Maybe I did, or maybe I didn't ask Tim to sign me breast. But I will say, after an awkward pause, he was pretty cool about it as he pulled out a sharpie and a tattoo gun and asked him with which one. <laughs>